All right. Now, um, excuse me. In John chapter 9 here, <clears throat> actually what I want to do real quick is finish up something. Remember last week in John chapter 8, I, I, there's one extra point that I wanted to, to bring up that I, that I realized later that I forgot to mention in John chapter 8. So I want to cover that real quick before we get into John chapter 9. John chapter 8, we finished up with Jesus Christ saying, I am He. And remember, we went into that, um, all these references, and, and we saw in the burning bush when, when the Lord revealed Himself unto Moses, when Moses asked, Who should I say sent me? And he said, I am He. He said, I am that I am. And then you tell him, I am hath sent you. And Jesus said, If you believe not that I am He, you shall die in your sins. Now, I've heard this said before. I didn't. I haven't studied it out completely on my own to verify that it's true. But you know, in the in um, the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah has 66 chapters, and I've heard it said that that each book number, each chapter corresponds with that with that chapter of, or with that book of the Bible. So, like Isaiah one has scriptures in there where you look at Genesis chapter one and you can see where the where the correlation is, and that goes on throughout every chapter of the Bible. Now, like I said. I don't know if that's true or not. I haven't studied it out. But it's real interesting because I have seen some examples where it does look very true. And I want you to flip back real quick. Keep your finger in John chapter 9. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 43. The 43rd book is, would, would correspond with the, with the book of John. Okay, so, so John is the 43rd book of the Bible. We're going to look at Isaiah 43. And I thought this was very interesting um, because... Over and over again throughout John chapter 8 was Jesus Christ as a main theme of him saying, I am he, I am he. And that's how we, how we finished off uh, last week's sermon with that point. If you're in Isaiah chapter 43, we're going to start reading in verse number 10. Isaiah 43, 10 says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am He, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? So we see over and over again here in Isaiah 43, that the Lord, God, Jehovah is saying, I am He. Beside me there is no Savior. Well, Jesus Christ is our Savior, and He is the one claiming to be, I am He. If you believe not, I am He, you shall die in your sins. Again, just all throughout the book of John, we see the deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ claiming to be, proclaiming to be God in the flesh. He knew who He was. And we're going to see that again in chapter 9 where he, he, again, makes that, that same proclamation. It's all throughout the book. A great, if anyone ever has a problem understanding the deity of Jesus Christ, you talk to someone in one of these other cults in the Jehovah's Witness or in the Mormons who don't believe that Jesus Christ was literally God in the flesh, the book of John is a great book for, to try to show them, to try to convince them if they'll hear, if they'll listen. Because all throughout the book of John, Jesus Christ is saying, it, and they'll bo they'll, both of those cults will say that, Jesus Christ is a prophet, that he was a good man, that he was the son of God. Well, how can he be good if you don't believe that he was God in the flesh, if he's claiming to be, I am he, if he's claiming to be God? And you show him Isaiah 43, where, the Lord, where God Jehovah is saying, I am he, beside me there is no Savior, yet you're going to call Jesus Christ the Savior. Very powerful. And I just wanted to point that out because I should have included that last week and I just forgot the reference, but I thought that was real interesting. I just kind of wanted to uh, wrap up from last week. So let's go ahead. Let's, get, let's dig into John chapter 9. There's all kinds of stuff to get into here in John chapter 9. We'll start rereading here in verse number 1. The Bible says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man that was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, this was an attitude that people have had all throughout history, even up to this day, where they look upon someone, they look on someone that, that has some kind of an affliction, they've got something wrong going in their life, and automatically just assume, oh man, that man must have sin in his life. So they see this man, he was blind from the birth. 
So they're just thinking automatically, well, there's no way that this guy would be blind unless he did something wrong or unless his parents did something wrong. So even Jesus Christ's disciples, I mean, they're saved, they're men of God, they still kind of have this attitude, they have this, this, this wrong outlook on, on sin and, and, um, and, and how they ought to, basically how they ought to be judging people. And they're asking, well, who sinned? And the only choice is, did he sin or did his parents sin? And Jesus is like, look, neither of them. He's not blind because of something wrong that his parents did. He's not blind because of something wrong that he did. This is, this, he, the reason he's blind today is for the glory of God because Jesus is going to heal him. This brings all, you know, a lot of glory unto the Lord for that great uh, miraculous healing. And we ought to be very, very careful with other people when we look upon them. When someone's got something bad going in their life, it's real easy to sit back and be like, yeah, they must have some... Especially people who... You know, I mean, it's one thing if, if people are just in open sin and they're living a life of wickedness and fornication and bad things happen to them. OK, you know, you could kind of see, well, yeah, we know we're going to reap what we sow. We know that's going to come. But when when people are, you know, people are living a pretty clean life, there's nothing obvious. You shouldn't just sit there and think, even think in your heart like, oh, man, that person must be in some really bad sin. You know, sometimes there'll be there'll be a lady that maybe loses a child, you know, um, whatever, whatever the circumstances may be. They lose a loved one. They lose their job. They have a major injury or an accident at work, and it could be just a, a freak accident. Just as just sit there and think, oh man, I wonder what kind of sin that person had. It's wrong. We ought not to just, to just be thinking that way about other people that they just automatically, just assume that they automatically must have some sin in their life. That's exactly what Job's friends did unto him. If you remember the story of Job, uh, you could flip back there if you would. In Job chapter 1, in verse number 1, keep your finger, we're going to keep, keep coming back to John chapter 9, but I just want to point this out because this is an attitude that, you know, even the, the disciples were influenced by this false belief that, that, just because someone has affliction, they must have done something wrong. And um, I preached about this just a couple weeks ago. We don't always know the reasons why bad things happen in our life. We don't always understand, you know, why things happen. There, there's, there's plenty of reasons why they, why they can. But we shouldn't just assume that a person has sinned just because bad things happen to them. We know, you know, Galatians 6 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. We know that to be true. Amen, that is true. But you don't always know why things are happening to somebody else. And that's why it's important that we, um, we ought not to just instantly just assume that someone might be doing something wrong. The Bible says in Job 1.1, 1, 1, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. So does, is the narrator of the Bible here in Job 1.1 1, 1, telling us that Job was just in all kinds of sin? No. Of course not. The Bible says that, that he was a righteous man. He was upright. He feared God. We saw him you know, perform, doing, um, performing sacrifices for his children just in case they had sinned. He was living. There's not a man more righteous upon the earth than Job was at that time. He was the most upright man in the earth. The Bible explains that to us in Job. But what did his friends say? Flip over real quick to Job chapter 4. This is one of Job's friends basically accusing him. Job 4, verse number 7. This is one of Job's friends answering him and trying to explain something to him. He says, Remember, I pray thee, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the righteous cut off? Even as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. So Job had his children killed. Job had all of his, his wealth just depleted, his livestock gone. And of course, we know from this story, we have the advantage of being able to look at the whole thing. We know that it was the devil that was provoking it to happen, and he's the one that caused all of these things to happen. It had nothing to do with sin in Job's life. Yet his friends come and they're saying, oh yeah, see, you must have all kinds of iniquity and wickedness in your life because other, that's what you reap. You're, you're just reaping what you've sown, Job. And um, in Job 22, verse 5, you don't have to turn it the Bible says, is not thy wickedness great and thy iniquities infinite? This is coming from Job's friends. They're saying, isn't your wickedness just great and your iniquities are, are infinite? You just, you just cannot cease from sinning is what they're accusing Job of. 
But that's not what God said about Job. God said that he was a perfect man and an upright servant. He was, he was an upright man living at that time. We can't always understand why bad things happen, especially to other people, but it's wicked to just think that they have some kind of sin and wickedness in their life. Oh, but we just can't see it. We just don't know about it. Maybe that is the case. I'm not saying that's never the case, but we can't just sit there in judgment of other people and then just start, especially what his friends were doing, his, his lousy comforters coming to him and just throwing all this stuff at him. That's not being a friend. <laughs> when your friend is down and out and they're having hard times, look, the, the worst thing you could do is just go and just start throwing things in their face. Okay, if you're going to be their friend, you're going to love them, you're going to be there for them, you're going to try to help them out and try to console them and try to comfort them and try to edify them. Especially if they're your brother in Christ. As they believed Job was, they just thought he was in all kinds of wickedness, even though they couldn't prove it and they had not a shred of evidence. And God said to the opposite. Let's go back to John chapter 9. But um, I just wanted to point that out here because, you know, it's easy to get caught up in this way of thinking that... Oh, here's somebody and they're, they're, they're afflicted for some reason and just automatically assume it's because of something they did. When it very, good, very well possibly could just be the sa that Satan attacking him. Or it could be some other person's sin caused that man to be blind. I mean, who knows? Um, if you don't know the reason, then, then, you know, I always like to think the best about people. When you don't know... You don't have any evidence. You know, if someone comes and, and tries to spread rumors or try to gossip about people, hey, so-and-so did this. Look, all you first, when I preached about this just last week, you ought not to be gossiping about them. You ought not to be a busybody and worried about what everyone else is doing. You know, mind your own business. And, you know, if it's something serious that needs to come up before the church, that's one thing. But it ought to be, you ought to be able to go to that person's face and say what, whatever it is, whatever complaint you have against them. And if it's something serious to bring before the church, then that ought to be done. But if you're just gossiping about, you know, oh, I can't believe so-and-so is doing this or doing that, look, keep that to yourself. I'm not going to re-preach that sermon. But um, it, it's this attitude, how do we look at other people? Do you love them? Do you have charity in your heart? Are you looking at them and just, and just automatically assuming, man, they've got a lot of sin in their life? Or are you looking at them as a brother, as a sister, and thinking, oh, it's too bad. You know, I'm sorry, man. I, I have compassion on this person because there's, there, there's something wrong in their life. I want to help them instead of just automatically thinking, oh, man, they, did, they must have done something bad by God. Let's keep reading here. Verse number four says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world... I am the light of the world. And, um, <clears throat> you know, Jesus giving sight to this blind man, it was just one more fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Uh, we're going to see this real quick in Isaiah. If you want to turn there, turn to Isaiah 42. I'm going to read for you from Isaiah 29. And we'll look at Isaiah 42. <clears throat> There's so many prophecies that Jesus Christ fulfilled on this earth and giving the blind sight was one of them. We could see that from the Old Testament. It says, um, I'll read from you, Isaiah 29, 18 says, And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel, which is exactly who Jesus Christ was, the Holy One of Israel, who brought the eyes of the blind to see. And Isaiah 42, if that's where you are, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. And we see that also later in the same exact chapter that Jesus Christ says that he has come to bring judgment. And that, that's at the end in verse 39 of John 9. says, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. So in Isaiah 41, 42 verse 1 says, um, I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. 
Thus saith God the Lord, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. I am the Lord, or I the Lord, excuse me, I the Lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for light of the Gentiles to open the blind eyes to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Just um, two real quick examples there of Jesus Christ fulfilling these prophecies of opening up the eyes of the blind. And obviously the metaphor to that of those that are spiritually blind, but as well those who are physically. He's doing all these physical works of healing people, which also carries also the, the, the metaphor of, of him spiritually healing those, the healing the sinners, healing the sick. Um, the lost that are in darkness bring the light unto them that they may see and receive that light. Um, we just read this. Flip back if you would. Actually, um, turn if you would to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. Because we just, we just got done reading in John 9, 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus Christ is the light. We saw that in John chapter 1, that he was the light, that John came to bear witness of the light. It says he was not that light, but came to bear witness of that light. Jesus Christ is the light that lights the whole world. He's explaining that here, while I am in this world, I am the light of the world. Bringing light to those that are in darkness. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. We start reading in verse number one. <clears throat> of course, this is following up from 1 Thessalonians 4 that's talking about the rapture. It's talking about people being, being caught up together with the Lord in the air, and so shall they ever be. And verse number one of chapter five is a continuation of what was, was written in chapter four. It says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, again, associating the rapture with the day of the Lord, very important when understanding end times prophecy, that when you're looking up the references, I mean, this is coming right after, this is saying, but of the times and the seasons. The times and the seasons of what? It's the times and the seasons of those being caught up together with the Lord in the air, and so shall they ever be. From chapter 4, I don't need to write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, it's calling that day the day of the Lord, so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. So people trying to tell you that, you know, well, we don't know, you know we're in darkness. How can we possibly know that when, when um, you know, that the Lord would come back at any moment? He says, you're not in darkness, that, that they should overtake you as a thief. If we had no clue when Jesus Christ was coming back at all, then it would overtake us as a thief. But he says, we're not in darkness. He says in verse 5, ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Watch for what? And I'm not going to go into the whole sermon. There's a whole sermon outside of this scope of this sermon. But Matthew 24 explains that, that the, the rapture is going to happen after the tribulation. He says, after the, uh, the sun and moon shall be darkened and the stars shall not give their life. And this happens after the tribulation of those days. And, um, you know, that's why we need to watch and to be sober because all of these things are going to come to pass. And, and um, we see in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 where it says that the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, pro, uh, by Daniel the prophet, is going to happen first. Actually, let's just turn there real quick. I don't want to misquote that verse. As long as I'm on this, I'm going to get off that subject real quick, but just a little food for thought. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 explains, um, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us is that the day of Christ is at hand. He's saying, look, don't let anyone trouble you or shake you thinking that the day of Christ is at hand like it could just come right now. He says, don't be deceived by that. In verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. 
For that day, what day? The day of Christ. For what day? The day of our gathering together unto him. As it says in verse number one, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So in order for that day to come, that man of sin has to be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. When that happens, when, when, the, when the Antichrist, when the son of perdition comes and he stands in the temple and he proclaims to be God, after that, then we can know that the day of Christ is at hand, but not before that. He says not to be deceived. Don't be tricked. That is not going to happen before that. And how do we know that? Because we're children of light. God has given us light. God has given us a revelation, and, and he gave to John the book of Revelation to reveal the things that were going to happen in the last days. But again, I don't want to make this an entire sermon based on end times prophecy. I'm going to do that again. I'm going to do that soon, but that's not time we're going to, I got to stay focused on John chapter 9, but I wanted to focus on 1 Thessalonians 5, see I get caught up in all these other sidetracks because we're so close to that scripture um, in, in Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, you are all the children of light, and this is how I got off on this to begin with. Um, this wasn't in my notes, I wasn't trying to go that direction, but I read it and it just... It just comes out there. But Jesus Christ had said, as, I, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world in John 9. So we're looking at 1 Thessalonians 5, where he says, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Let us therefore, or let us, therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. So Jesus Christ is a light of the world, right? And once you get saved, you have that light in yourself. We are children of light. We ought to walk as children of light and not walk as the world does, not walk as those that are lost and in darkness. We ought to put on the, we ought to walk as children of light. And how do we do that? He says, you know, they that sleep, sleep at night, and they be drunken or drunken at night. So you ought not to be drunken. You ought not to be, you know, drinking alcohol, drinking booze, you know, getting high. He says to be sober. And, you know, people always like to ask that question. They say, well, you know, the Bible doesn't say anything about doing drugs. The Bible doesn't say anything about smoking pot. So I guess it's not a sin, is it? Well, you know what? It does handle that. It says be sober. Be sober. Now, you start doing drugs, would you call yourself sober? I don't think so. And, you know, that also handles for the people that like to just, that still like to, to sip on their booze a little bit and they say, oh, well, I'm not getting drunk. But are you sober? No. You take your first drink of alcohol, the first thing to go is your judgment. Even if you're not drunk, even if you're not falling over yourself and tripping, you start drinking that alcohol, you are no longer sober. You are no longer completely clear-minded and the Bible tells us that we are children of the day and that we ought to be sober. And, and shame on you if, you if you even look at alcohol. The Bible says in, in the book of Proverbs that look not thou on the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. He says don't even look at it. Because all it's going to do is cause your heart to utter perverse things. It's going to cause wickedness. It's going to cause you to get into further sin Alcohol is like the poison of asps. Watch out for it. It's dangerous. It is a poison. Alcohol is, has no good benefit or effect for you. People, the doctors that claim to say, oh, a glass of wine a day is good for your heart. You know why it's good for you? It has nothing to do with the alcohol content. It has to do with the grapes and the grape juice. You can get the same exact positive benefit from just drinking grape juice. The alcohol is a poison. You do not need that alcohol in your body and in your system. The Bible is proved right over and over again. It is a poison, just like the, the venom of asps. Um, stay away from it. We're children of light. We ought to walk as children of light. Let's go back to John chapter 9. John chapter 9, verse number 6. It says, When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of of the blind man with the clay, and he said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. The neighbors therefore, and they which before had seen him, 
that he was blind said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. So this guy, Jesus Christ, he would just get in the story here. This man's blind. He is blind from birth. Jesus Christ sees him and he, um, he spits on the ground and he makes clay, he makes mud basically out of, out of the dirt and he, and he anoints his eyes. So he rubs, he rubs that, that dirt, that spit dirt on his eyes and, um, and he tells him, okay, now go wash. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he does that. So he goes, he washes and as soon as he washes, he could see, which is amazing. And think about how amazing that must be for this man. He's never understood sight. He's never had vision before. It's not like he had an injury where he used to be able to see so he knows what it's like to have vision but now all of a sudden he can't see and then he's healed again. He's never seen anything in his entire life. He's gone his entire life being blind. And Jesus Christ opened up his eyes. And again, it's, it's a, you, know, you can think about that metaphorically as sinners. You know, we go through this world lost in darkness blind. We can't understand the truth, but when someone shines the light of the glorious gospel, those, those um, blinders that are over our eyes, that prevent us from knowing the truth and from seeing the truth and from, from understanding God's words, the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, hey, those blinders come off. All of a sudden, we can see. We can see what God has for us to do. We can understand His words. And that's, a, that's an amazing thing. And as Jesus is doing these things, it's an amazing miracle that he did for this man. I can't imagine what it must be like for a person like that to receive that type of healing. And people are looking at him and questioning, like, wait, isn't that the guy that was, that's always begging? Isn't that the guy that's always by the church and he's always asking people for money, asking for help, you know, because he can't work, because he's blind? Isn't that, isn't that that guy? I mean, we've seen him our, our whole life. It's been that way since birth. Isn't that him? And what's he doing? He walked around, he could see now. And people are saying, no, like, that looks like him. You know, like, I think that looks like him, but no, that's not really at him. And he's saying, look, it is me. I, I'm, it's real. It really happened. He says, I am he in verse number 9. Verse number 10 says, therefore said they unto him, how were thine eyes open? How did that happen? How can you see? He answered and said, a man that is called Jesus made clay. And he tells him the story and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed. And I received sight. It's a pretty simple story. So he, made, he made the clay, put it on my eyes, I went and washed, and now I can see again. It's from Jesus. Verse number 12, Then said they unto him, Where is he? And he said, I know not. They brought him therefore, <clears throat> or they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. So they're bringing this guy before the Pharisees now. And we know all throughout the book of John, the Pharisees don't believe in Jesus Christ. There were a few that believed but they wouldn't say that openly. And by and large, the Pharisees rejected Jesus Christ. They wanted to have nothing to do with him. And so they're bringing this guy before the Pharisees to get an explanation here. Verse 14 says, And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And see how this keeps coming up. The Sabbath day, the Sabbath day. This is one of the reasons why the Pharisees hated Jesus Christ and they wanted him dead because they were thinking that he was disobeying the Sabbath, disregarding that, therefore he wasn't of God because he was breaking the Sabbath by healing people. And we've already learned that that's because of lack of understanding of the law. And, um, you know, Jesus exposes their hypocrisy with the circumcision. They say, you know, Moses commanded that, that after eight days that a child should be circumcised. He says, if it's a Sabbath day, you obey the, the commandment of Moses and you circumcise a child. And he's saying, look, if I've made someone every bit, every whit whole, on the Sabbath day, you know, you're calling that a sin, yet it's okay for you to circumcise on the Sabbath day? And he just kind of exposes their hypocrisy. But over and over again, this issue of him healing on the Sabbath day just, is just a driving point for these Pharisees that they, that, that they don't like. It. And it just kind of uncovers their lack of understanding of the law. And it says um, in verse 15, Then again, the Pharisees also asked him, how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I wash and do see. So he already told the people of the town that saw him. He's like, this is how it happened. So they bring him before the Pharisees, and he reiterates the story to the Pharisees. Verse 16 says, Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. And see, th again, this is, this is like a common theme. I feel like I'm being a dead horse sometimes because this comes up over and over again throughout the book of John. We're only in chapter number 9. 
Yet there's this division created by Jesus Christ and what he said and what he did. And, and you know, people like to think that, you know, everybody should be unified over Jesus Christ and that he came to unite the whole world. Well, no. Jesus Christ came. He says that he brought division. He brings a sword. He's here because Jesus Christ is truth. He is the truth. And the truth is always going to divide people because you either believe it or you don't. And if you don't believe the truth, you're basically making it a liar. You're saying it's a lie. If you don't believe something that's said, you're saying that's not true, that's a lie. And Jesus Christ comes and he's saying things and he's doing things and people can look at that and say he's either, he either is the truth or he's not. He's claiming to be God. He either is or he isn't. He's either a liar or he's a man of God. And he's righteous. And people here are saying, well, look, how can somebody that's, that's in sin and that's not of God be performing such miracles and opening the eyes of the blind? And we saw earlier that the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost was said of those that were able to see Jesus Christ's miracles. They were literally were able to see what he did, yet they, they said that he was of the devil, that Jesus had a devil, and that's how he had these powers to heal people. And the Bible said that that was the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost that never hath forgiveness. When you, when you can look at Jesus Christ, when you can look at the miracles that he's performing, the miracles that he does, and say, that's of the Satan, that's of the devil, and you, you're, like he's physically there in front of you and he's doing this stuff, that's when you don't have forgiveness. That is when you have hardened your heart to the point of, I mean, that's like ridiculousness. I mean, think about it. Imagine if someone were to be alive today and were doing the things that Jesus Christ was doing. I mean, just being able to witness these types of works and the healing and the power and also fulfill, fulfilling Scripture and doing everything, you know, if we were just to pretend that Jesus Christ hadn't come and the New Testament hadn't happened and we were just to be in this time frame where we start to see this stuff happening, you would have to have a heart of stone, a hard heart to, to reject that and say, even though I see these miracles, even though he's fulfilling the prophecy, I'm, I still just don't believe it. And that's why the Bible says that they're, they're blaspheming the Holy Ghost and they're rejected because they've had way more than enough opportunity to see and to believe. And, um, you know, the Bible, t he, Jesus tells Thomas, you know, you believe, you've seen these things and you have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. So you have a lot more going for you when you can see the miracles and you can see these other things going on than when you can't see them. But, um, and that's why he held them to the standard and, and they were able to do that, that blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. But anyways, we see here that some people believed and some people didn't. Some people thought he was a man of God and others thought that he was a sinner. The Pharisees held with that point that, that nope, he broke the Sabbath day, he's not of God. Um, Verse number 17 says, They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. So I said, Well, what do you think about Jesus? He says, Well, he's a prophet. And verse 18 says, But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him. That so now they're starting to believe, You know what? This, you weren't really blind. Like, there's no way that happened. And then they have to actually call his parents and be like, is this, was your son blind? And that's what he, they ask him. They're like, um, verse number 19 says, and they ask them saying, is this your son who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. So they verify it. His parents are like, yes, this is our son. And yes, he was born blind. Verse 21, but by what means he now seeth we know not, or who hath opened his eyes we know not. He is of age, ask him, he shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, said his parents, he is of age, ask him. So they verified the fact that he was his son. They verified that he was healed. You know, he was blind, and now he can see. And this is our son. But they didn't want to say it was because of Jesus. And the reason why the Bible says that they didn't want to say that to the Jews is because they were afraid. They feared the Jews. The Jews had this, you know, the, the, the more Jesus taught, 
the more they wanted to kill him and the more they, they had resistance against Jesus and they wanted to stop his teaching, stop everything that was going on. So he would, they would basically were threatening people. Look, it was well known that if you were going to talk about Jesus Christ, if you're going to claim Jesus, you're going to get kicked out of the synagogue. You are not going to be allowed back into the synagogue. And um, that's why people, when Jesus went to that feast, no one spake of him openly for fear of the Jews. The Jews had this control over the people where, where people were just living in fear of even talking about Jesus Christ because he was doing such a great work and they feared that was a threat to their power, as a threat to, to everything that they had going for them because Jesus Christ was upending everything that they did and everything that they believed in because they didn't believe on him. They believe, they believe a false religion, just as the Jews today, Judaism today, is a false religion, an antichrist religion that doesn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So they, they say that, you know, they didn't believe, they, didn't, they don't know how we believe, so they're just kind of pushing it off on their son. Well, just, just ask him, you know, hey, he's a grown man, he's of age, ask him, ask him how, how, he, uh, how he's able to see. And then it says in verse 24, then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. He's like, I don't know if the guy, he's like, I don't know that much about the guy. I don't know if he's a sinner, but all I know is that he healed me. And he believed that he was a prophet because he was able to do those things. He was able to do that type of miracle. We know Jesus Christ obviously wasn't a sinner, but they believed because he broke the Sabbath that he was a sinner. Verse number 26, Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? And I love his answer here because they're asking him, they already found out, like they asked him, How did you get healed? How, how are you able to see now? And he gave them the whole story. So they're asking him again, like, well, how did he do it? I mean, what did he do? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and he did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? They say, look, oh, what? You're asking me again? I already told you. Do you want to be his disciples? Is that why you're asking me? You want to learn more about it? And I, I just love that response that he gives them. And then they reviled him. They got angry and they're like, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. Now, were they really Moses' disciples? Nope. Jesus Christ said, If you believe Moses, you'd believe me, for he wrote, he spake of me. He wrote of me. They weren't really, they, they think they do. Just like there's a lot of people today that they claim to be Christians, they claim to believe the Bible. All kinds of people, they, they make that claim. Just as the Pharisees, they claim to believe in Moses, but they don't. They believe it. They might believe in the law, and most people, they, they do. They believe in their works. They believe in their own works of righteousness to save their soul. They believe that they're following the Ten Commandments, and they're following the Bible, and that's what's going to get them to heaven, but they don't. If they understood the Bible, they believe, they put their faith completely on Jesus Christ, and then they would know, and then they would truly believe on God. They don't believe that they're what these people that are just trusting in the law to save them. Verse 29 says, We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now, um, I brought this up two weeks ago in John chapter 7. Flip back, if you would, real quick to John chapter 7, just two chapters back, because here they're saying, well, we don't even know where this guy's from. Whence means from where. We don't know where this Jesus is from. And, you know, the, this guy answers them, the, the, the former blind man, saying, well, that's kind of amazing. You don't know where he's from, yet he opened up mine eyes. In John chapter 7, look at verse number 27. He says, this was again the Pharisees saying, Howbeit we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. So, in one case they're saying, well, we, we know where he's from, but when, when Christ comes, you know, no one knows where he's from. And then in chapter 9 they're saying, well, we don't even know where he's from. And that's where, that's where this guy catches him up and says, oh, okay, you don't know where he's from? Because the, the very same people, the Pharisees, are saying, well, when Christ cometh, we don't know where he's from. And you don't know where he's from, and yet he's opening up mine eyes? I'm just saying, right? But um, we'll wrap things up here. Let's keep reading here. He says, 
Verse 31, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And, and that is really powerful because you think of the miracles of the Old Testament, there were a lot of miracles. Um, Elisha, Elijah, these, these prophets of the Old Testament, they did perform miracles. If you remember, they were able to, it, you know, Jesus Christ was able to feed, he fed the 5,000, he fed the 4,000. He was able to, to feed people with, with, the, with a small number of bread and fishes. Well, that miracle was also performed in the past, a similar miracle. If you remember when um, Elijah went unto the, to the woman that was collecting sticks that, for her and her son to, to make a meal and then that they could eat it and die because they were out of food. And he goes, yeah, well, first just go and, and make me a cake first. And that miracle was performed that the, the oil failed not and, and they, they had um, the, the meal failed not from the barrel. Um, and they, they were able to eat of that meal for, for an extended period of time where that little bit of food that they had just continued. And there's other miracles where you can see they were repeated in the New Testament, but they weren't brand new. Opening up the, of the eyes of someone that was blind from birth that was new. And you might even think that, you know, maybe someone who's been injured in their eye and they became blind, you could see how medically someone might be able to help heal them and bring them back to sight. But no one was able to be brought, given their sight when they were born blind, which is an amazing miracle and just a testament to Jesus Christ and who he was. That he was able to perform such a miracle. Now I want to focus a little bit on that statement where he says, now we know that God heareth not sinners. Now, when we pray, what are we doing? We're talking to God. We're asking God for things. So God needs to hear our prayers when we pray to him. And this man is speaking the truth when he's saying this. Now, sometimes you can't always believe what somebody is saying if it's not like Jesus or if it's not the author. You know, if it's, we don't know if he's speaking you know, of the Holy Spirit, but we can prove that what, he is, what this man that, was, that received his sight is saying is true from other passages of Scripture when he said, God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. This is a very important point that we need to understand that's going to help our prayer life. If you want God to hear you, if you want God to answer your prayers, we need to make sure that one, we're not living a sinful lifestyle. The Bible says, you know, he says that God heareth not sinners, but if we're a worshiper of God and we're doing his will, then he will hear us. And this is backed up by scripture. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter number 3. I'll read for you from Proverbs 28. You're turning to 1 Peter 3. Proverbs 28 verse 9 says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. You know, a lot of people today would like to think, well, God hears all prayer. God, you know, you just pray. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You just keep praying to God. God's going to hear you. Well, some prayers, according to the Bible, are abomination. If you turn your ear away from, if, if you don't want to hear the law, if you don't want to hear what God has for you, why in the world do you think God's going to want to listen to what you have? You need to listen to God first. He's given us His law. He's given us the commandments. We ought to listen to Him if we expect God to listen to us. It says, it says it's an abomination, your prayer. I would hate to be praying to God and God just, just hating the fact that I'm praying to Him, that it's, that it's held as an abomination to Him. But that's the case if you refuse to hear His word. If you don't listen to Him from this first, don't go asking him for things um, unless you're calling on the name of the Lord for salvation. That's about the only thing that I think he's going to hear. But even to do that, you're going to have to hear this book. You have to hear his word before you can call on him in belief, um, as Romans 10 states. If you're in 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse number 12. 1 Peter 3, 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, the prayers of the righteous, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. 
He's not going to hear those prayers. We have to do what's right. And then in 1 John chapter 3, you're in 1 Peter, just a few more pages over. 1 John chapter 3. First John 3, look at verse number 22. The Bible says, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Why do we receive what we ask? Let's keep reading. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. That is how you're going to get your prayers answered. If you have, you have a burden on your heart, you have, you have something going wrong in your life, you have something going wrong in a loved one's life, you have things that you need, and we ought to be going to God in prayer for, for all of our needs, for everything that we have going on. Well, hey, if you, want those, if you expect those prayers to be answered, you better be doing what's right. We better be keeping His commandments. I mean, to the best of our ability. Obviously, we know that we're sinners. Okay, I don't expect anyone here to be a perfect person and obey His law and His commandments completely without error. That's not possible, but we can't just ignore his word. I mean, we can't, when you hear something, you can't just be like, oh, I don't like that. I'm not going to do that. I, I don't like what the Bible says about drinking alcohol. I'm, I'm just going to ignore that part. Well, you, you decide, you start picking and choosing the parts of the Bible you want to listen to. God's going to start picking and choosing what prayers he wants to answer for you. But if we're doing what's right, if we're not, you know, turning our ear from God, He's, he's going to listen to you. The Bible says, ask and you shall receive. That's a great promise. You pray to God. Hey, we can be confident in the things that we ask him for if, there's a condition on it, if we're keeping his commandments, if we're doing those things that are pleasing in his sight. And you think about it, it makes sense. We're, if you're born again, you're a child of God. God's your father. And, and we'll break it down to a real simple illustration. My children, if they're not listening to what I'm saying, if they're disobeying me, they know the rules, but they just go out and they want to do whatever they want to do. And then they come to me and say, hey, dad, let's go out for ice cream. Hey, dad, can you get me this treat? Hey, dad, I want to get this toy. How likely am I going to be to answer their request, their prayer to me when they're just disobeying me and not listening? Not very likely. I'm probably not going to hear them. I'll be like, no. And that's exactly how I am with them. But now let's say, you know, they're doing good. You know, I tell them, okay, I need you to clean up your room. And they go and do it. Hey, I need you to do this. And they do it. And they're not talking back. And they're just doing it. And they're doing that which is right. And, they, and then let's say they even go above and beyond what I'm not even asking them to do. Oh, here, Dad, here's a glass of water. Oh, thanks. You know, I didn't even ask for that. Then they come to me and just ask me for something. How likely am I going to be to answer them? Probably, if, if, I'm, if I'm able to do it, I'll probably do it. It's very pleasing when, when your children are, are listening to you and obeying you and respecting you and doing what's right. Well, hey, it's no different with God. We're His children. He's our Father. If we're listening to Him, you know, we're, we're trying to be attentive and, and God, I'm gonna, you know, we're not perfect, but we're going we're gonna to see what you have for us to do. We're going to do your will. You know, and then we ask Him for things. Hey, if we're, I mean, if we're pleasing to Him, of course He's going to answer our prayers. But it's important to remember that, that, that if we want our prayers to be answered, we need to make sure that we're respecting Him and that we're respecting His laws, His commandments, and doing what His will is, what He has for us to do in our lives. Let's go back to John chapter 9. We'll finish up the chapter here real quick. So this man answers him. He says, you know, if this man were not of God... He could do nothing. There's no way he'd be able to heal my eyes if he wasn't of God. God has to be with them in order to perform this type of a miracle. And they really don't like that answer. So they answer, the Pharisees answer him back in verse 34. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. This is that proud attitude that the Pharisees had. They looked at people as just, Oh, you're not learned. You're ignorant men. That's how they looked at Jesus Christ's disciples. Oh, these are unlearned and ignorant men. They're just, they're just fishermen. You know, they just, they just have this blue-collar job. They just work in a trade. What do they know? They're ignorant. We know all this stuff. We were taught in all these ways. You know, we have all this understanding and all this skill. And they just look down on people all the time. And as I mentioned in my, in my sermon recently about taking correction. Look, if it's coming from God's Word, God's Word is the truth. It doesn't matter where the source is coming from. If it's coming from someone who didn't go to this, 
you know, most famous Bible college, or they didn't go to, you know, in, in this church or that church or whatever. Look, if it's coming from God's word, I don't care if it's my daughter that brings to me some truth from the Bible. If it's God's word, it's God's word. We ought not to ever think that we're so high and mighty and that we just know so much more than everybody else that nobody can bring any type of truth or any type of reason to us from the scripture, which is exactly what this guy was. Look, he was a poor blind man. He was a beggar, right? He's not somebody that was held in reputation as someone who just knows the scripture and knows the Bible. But he, this was what he was saying was absolutely true. And those Pharisees needed to hear that, but they didn't receive it because they were just too proud and, and relied on their own understanding too much. Instead of just being able to understand the most basic concept of, of what an incredible miracle that was. Instead of focusing on the, the incredible miracle, they focused on the day. There's a lot we can learn from people. Don't ever allow yourself to get too proud to where we can't receive just simple truths from God's word when they're exposed to us. No matter how much studying and everything else you've done. Look, I'm not saying everyone's always right. Just because someone brings something to you doesn't mean you're right. But if it's right, if it's true from God's word, hey, receive that regardless of the source. And give God the glory because it's coming from God anyways. It's, you know, if I'm up here and I'm repeating God's word, hey, this, isn't, this isn't me. This isn't something I came up with. This is God's truth that's, that's here for us. Um, man doesn't get any of this credit. It's, it, the credit all goes to God for God's truths. But they didn't want to hear him. They think that he was just born in sin, which is why he was blind. Um, that same attitude. Um, but let's keep reading here. Verse 36. He answered and said, um, <clears throat> Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. So right here is, a, is, a, is one of the scriptures where Jesus Christ is, is by himself claiming to be the Son of God. And there's people out there, and it's, it might sound ridiculous, but there's a lot of people that believe that you know, oh, the disciples, you know, they made more out of Jesus than he actually was. Um, they'll say that, that they're the ones that deified Jesus and that Jesus himself never really claimed to be the Son of God and he never really claimed to be God in the flesh. Oh, yes, he did. People that say that is because they're not, they're ignorant of the scripture. They don't even understand. This is a very clear example when a man asks him, look, Jesus tells him, you have to believe on the Son of God. And he says, well, who is he? I want to believe on the Son of God. Who is he? And Jesus Christ basically said, it's me. It's, it's him that's, that's talking to you right now. Um, a very, very powerful claim. Again, and it's all throughout the book of John. There's so many places we can look. Just in the last chapter, in chapter 8, where he says, I am he. Who? I am who? Well, we saw in Isaiah 43, I am he. Beside me there is no Savior. That's who he is. Jesus Christ is the Savior. Verse number 30. Let's keep reading. We're almost done. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Again, if Jesus Christ were, were of God, yet he were not God in the flesh, he should not be receiving that worship right there. He should be saying, stand up on your feet as all of the other prophets and all the other men of God have done when men have fallen down at their feet. They say, get up on your feet. I'm a man like you. That's what Peter said. That's what Paul said when these people would come to them and think, oh, wow, you're healing people. You must be God. They fall in worship. He say, stand up. Look, I'm a man just like you are. Jesus Christ never did that. Thomas worshiped him. He said, my Lord and my God. Jesus Christ received that worship and he received that praise because it was true. Because he was God in the flesh. Let's keep reading here. Verse 39. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world that they which see not might see and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now you say, We see Therefore, your sin remaineth. I love how Jesus, you know, Jesus was not this effeminate, you know, hippie peacenik that just 
never wanted to get in an argument with anyone, that always was just, you know, walking around and, and was, you know, never had strife with, with anybody. He told it like it was. He wasn't afraid. He didn't mince his words. He wasn't afraid to, to speak the truth. And that's exactly what we see him doing here. I mean, he wasn't afraid to tell the Pharisees right to their face that, therefore, your sin remaineth. Hey, you're still in your sins. You think that you see. You, th you don't think you're blind. You know, they're, they're kind of mockingly asking him, oh, are we blind also? Because they thought they were so smart. They thought they were so read, well-read in the Word of God. He says, you know what? If you were blind, basically, I wouldn't hold against you. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have had sin if you, if you really were blind. But he says, because you say you see, because you think you know, hey, your sin remaineth. And... Um, Jesus didn't, didn't walk on eggshells around these people. He didn't mince his words. He didn't, he didn't hold back. He, he spoke the truth. And he spoke the truth in love, but he, but he didn't hold anything back. And um, you know that's the way that, that a man of God ought to be, is not afraid to preach the word, not, not compromising, not being worried about who I may or may not offend if you're preaching God's word. It never ought to be watered down or held back. You know, the Bible says what it says. And that's one of the reasons why we do these Bible studies on Wednesday nights um, where we go through every verse of these chapters because, you know, one day at the end of, you know, Lord willing, if I'm still around, I think it's going to take like 33 some years or whatever to get through every book of the Bible going one chapter a week. Um, you know, we'll get through all the words of God. We're not going to leave any of this unpreached. It's all going to be preached. We're going to touch on all of it because it's all truth and, and we can get something out of everything. We're not going to say, oh, well, I'm not going to preach that because that might offend some people. No way. No way. Shame on you if that's, if that's what you think. Um, God's words are pure. This is truth. We're going to, we're going to, I stand on God's words every single last verse, every line. It's, um, you know, I'm not going to let this world or the philosophy of this world corrupt me into thinking that, oh, well, that's, I shouldn't talk about that because I don't want to hurt someone's feelings. Well, if it's the truth, they need to hear the truth, whether it hurts their feelings or not. It's not, it's not my job to try to manage how someone else deals with hearing the truth. It's just my job to preach the truth. And that's what, how we ought to do it, is just preach the truth and, you know, hey, either people are going to receive it or not. And I know personally, you know, I want to know the truth. That's what I'm interested in. That's why we're here at Word of Truth Baptist Church. We want to know what the truth is. We're not, we're not some, some little kids that are super fragile with our, with our emotions. Look, we can handle it. <laughs> Tell us the truth. I just want to know what it is. If it, if it stings a little bit, let me know. I want to know it. Because I want to get right. I don't care if it, if, you know, if it, if it hurts a little bit. I want to get what's right. I want to know the truth. The Bible says the truth will make you free. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for, for the book of John and all the great truths that we learn from it, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just, just open up our eyes to your words. God, I pray that you would please help us to stand strong in your words and, um, and never compromise and never back down. Lord, we thank you for these, these great stories in the Bible, uh, just showing the, the miracles that Jesus Christ did and... Um, the fact that, that he came to, to save sinners and he came to, to heal the sick and, to, and he raised the dead, dear Lord, I pray that you would please just help us to have unwavering faith in Jesus Christ and that um, we'd never back down from standing firm on your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.